Welcome to the Estate Planning Made Simple podcast by LSPN, one of the nation's largest and best estate planning networks. The information provided on this podcast does not constitute legal advice. All information, content, and materials available on this podcast are for general information purposes only. All right. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to continue the conversation about estate planning as it relates to asset protection planning and international planning today. Uh, appreciate everybody jumping on. So, you know, the idea of asset protection planning is to make sure that whatever you've saved up, whatever you've accumulated, whatever you have that's yours, gets protected from potential creditors, liabilities, lawsuits, uh, you know, issues like that. And a lot of times people uh, have the impression that if you go offshore, that that's the most protection that you can get for asset protection purposes. And so there's a lot of uh, companies out there. There's a lot of you know planners that will do offshore asset protection trusts or offshore entities uh, with the intention of protecting your uh, property by putting it in another country and then building entities around it, right? The idea is that when you uh, structure any kind of entity, whether it's a corporation, uh, a trust, you know, those sort of structures are all subject to the laws of the jurisdiction where it's set up. And so the laws of the jurisdiction can vary pretty, pretty dramatically. For example, if you're in California, it's a very plaintiff friendly state, you might get a different outcome in a jury trial than if you were in Wyoming or Nevada, right? And the laws of the jurisdiction are also going to determine what you can be sued for, how your property is going to be affected if there is a uh, liability against you, uh, what can be protected, what responsibilities you have as maybe a manager or an owner of a company, or if you're the, you know, the trustee or a beneficiary of a trust, you know, what uh, potential liability could attach to you personally, as opposed to being stuck inside of the, uh, the entity. And, a lot of times, you know, we don't think that that's a, that big of a deal, whether we get sued in one state or another state or in one country or another country, that the result's going to turn out the same. But the law and the choice of law can really make a huge difference. So when you structure an asset protection plan, choosing where you want to cite us your plan is extremely important. And there's a lot of jurisdictions in the United States that are very good for asset protection purposes that you can set up entities and structures within the United States without having to go offshore. So for example, you know, some of the favorites have been Delaware, Nevada, you know, those are a little overused and some courts will just look at that and recognize that maybe it was set up for the purpose of asset protection. And and so they uh, don't throw a lot of weight behind it. But then other states have kind of gotten into the mix as well and are very good states for asset protection purposes like Alaska, Wyoming, even Texas, Utah, you know, some of those states gotten into the mix. So the idea of establishing an entity that's going to be subject to the laws of a specific state or a specific jurisdiction, and then combining that with the protective nature of those laws and of the structure that you set up, that's what provides you with that protection. So sometimes when people say, well, you know, I want to protect my assets and I want to go offshore, they think, well, that's going to be even better because it's harder for people to get to it. And that's true. Part of the strategy of asset protection planning is to increase the cost of litigation. So if somebody wants to try to get to your assets, they're going to have to litigate where your structure is and the laws of that jurisdiction are going to control, but also the cost of litigation may be more expensive to litigate there. So for example, if I have uh, a company in Costa Rica, just as an example. Then, you know, somebody going after my company would have to sue me in Costa Rica for uh, for a harm that was committed there, or they're going to have to try to pull my company into another jurisdiction, which is a lot more difficult. And so in order to avoid that, uh, you know, we basically put you in a, a situation where you can settle the case easier, And your asset protection plan should have a combination of insurance policies plus entities. The entities give you uh, basically a 
strong disincentive for whatever liability or lawsuits or creditors that are trying to come after you to try to continue going after you because of the cost that it's going to take for them to collect. Almost no plaintiff's counsel wants to have to fight through, um, you know, to have to fight through uh, entities and legal defense and everything else. They just want the quick settlement. They want the insurance dollars. So <clears throat> the, the idea of setting up these structures provides a disincentive for them to try to get to your personal assets. And then if you have insurances in place, then those provide an incentive for them to stop and not continue because they'll get the insurance money if they settle the case and they won't get it until the case is actually settled. So, you know, when you go offshore with a structure, that may make the cost of litigation more expensive. But it also could make the cost of litigation more expensive for you. So it, it kind of cuts both ways, right? Um, going to another another country's court system requires that you have legal counsel that can represent you there, requires that you have some understanding of, you know, the repercussions that are going to happen under the laws of that jurisdiction and so on. And so, you know, for asset protection planning offshore, there are different uh, purposes that we go to different jurisdictions. Some jurisdictions are very good for the purpose of even if they get a judgment against you, which can be difficult and it can be expensive and unlikely for them to be able to do. But even if they do get a judgment, then they can't collect on the judgment because there's no extradition treaties that would allow for your money to be sent to the United States for collection purposes. And there's also protective laws from collection. So your trustee or your manager of your company, you know, they can choose not to pay out and then uh, being able to collect becomes very difficult, right? So some of those places would include Ireland, uh, the Cook Islands. Um, uh, there's other, other um, you know, jurisdictions that are very popular for those purposes and that have become... Uh, kind of safe havens to set up structures because they'll protect your interests by making it very expensive to litigate, making it very complicated to collect. But some judges have also seen that and they say, oh, well, you know, you went to the Cook Islands for the purpose of hiding money or for the purpose of, you know, getting away from liability. And a, a U.S.-based judge might throw the book at you simply by virtue of the fact that they think that you went offshore to somehow avoid responsibilities of some kind. So in order to avoid that perception, there are other jurisdictions that might work just as effectively or even more effectively, right? So another uh, strategy is to go to countries that have a different system of law. So in the United States, we follow what's called common law. And then we also have what we call statutory law. Statutory law is, you know, the, the laws on the books that Congress passes and, and so on and so forth. They control, you know, what you're supposed to do, what you can't do, and so on. But uh, common law are the, is the law that's established by the court system. So every time that there's a judgment or, you know, a result from uh, a, a court, especially if it's a controlling court like uh, an appeals court or the Supreme Court, those those judgments, those results have to be followed the next time around. Our law is intended to be predictable. And so, um, you know, in similar situations with similar fact patterns, two people should get the same results going through the court system. That's the intention of the legal system. And because of that, common law says that a, a judgment that was entered with a similar sort of situation is going to get the same result because you have to follow what that judge decided in the previous case. Well, in some countries, they don't have that requirement. They don't have common law. So even if one person was able to collect in, one example was Belize, right? If one person was able to collect against a, a, a creditor or a, you know, a debtor in Belize, that doesn't mean that the next person can collect also because they have to consider every single case de novo. Uh, that means, you know, with, with its new fact pattern every single time to determine whether you can collect or not. So we use those jurisdictions for purposes of uh, setting up structure, setting up entities and putting assets there 
that can't be collected against in the first place. And again, it becomes expensive to try to litigate for somebody to try to collect against you. But then if you have your assets in a structure in those countries, the likelihood is that they're not going to be able to collect anyway, because there's no established law saying that they can, and they have to fight through and be able to prove that there's a collection right. And that, you know, even though there's no extradition treaty, and that there's uh, a method for them to be able to pull the money back to the United States somehow. So that's the advantages of going offshore, right? The problems with going offshore and setting up these kind of structures offshore is that the costs of, maintain, uh, of maintaining those structures and, and the complexity of it might not be worth it. So we had a client, for example, they sold a, they sold a business. They were going to have substantial taxes, but they were just kind of, you know, fed up with the United States court processes. They had, you know, maybe a couple bad experiences in the past, and they were uh, not too excited about the direction that, you know, current politics have gone. And so they said, I want all of my assets outside of the United States. So they set up a structure uh, in, the, in the Caribbean to hold, their, um, to hold their assets, to hold their money. And then they have a, a third party administrator company that acts as their registered agent and to manage their offshore trust, right? And, uh, you know, every year they have to pay for maintenance fees to be able to maintain this structure. And every time that they want access to the money, they have to call and ask for permission for somebody to administer it and then be able to send it over, right? One of the issues is that they now want to use the money to set up a new company in the United States. Well, as soon as they take the money out of that structure, it's no longer going to be protected, right? And if they use all of the money doing that, then there's no need for that structure anymore. The other thing is that, you know, as they set it up, the rules that they put into their trust from the beginning, those are the rules that have to be followed down the road. And so a lot of times, you know, companies that will sell these kind of plans, they use cookie cutter forms. And in his particular situation, the company that set up his offshore trust had terms in the trust that did not allow him to be able to use it for particular things. So he, was, he wasn't he was able to use his assets then to set up this company the way he wanted to, even though they're his assets, he's the one that you know should have all the control. He had to give up that control in order to get the asset protection in this offshore structure. So it can cause complexities, it can cause issues down the road if it's not set up appropriately. So we always encourage you to set up uh, these sort of structures with competent legal counsel, sit down with somebody who can explain, you know, what you're doing and why you're doing it. And then we always recommend, you know, yes, there are advantages to going to specific jurisdictions offshore, but there are probably more advantages to choosing the jurisdiction that is going to fit your lifestyle best. What, what do I mean by that? If you have no connections to a specific country and you have no reason to go there and you have no, you know, no other uh, ties to, to that location other than the asset protection structure that you've set up, that might not be a good enough reason for you to choose the place. So we always ask our clients, you know, they say, I want to go offshore. I want to protect my assets. I want to put them somewhere outside of the United States. Where should I go? My first question is, well, where do you like to travel? We just talked to somebody the other day. She's, you know, a citizen of Ireland. She's lived in the United, in the United Kingdom. She's, you know, has a lot of ties out there. It makes sense for her to go there. Why would she put it anywhere else, right? Uh, we have, you know, somebody that we sat down with not too long ago, and they were talking about setting up an offshore structure. And I said, where do you like to travel? And they said, well, I really like traveling to Europe. And I said, well, what part of Europe? Oh, well, you know, I like Great Britain and that sort of thing. Great. Ireland's a great choice. But then, you know, we sat down with another family and they had connections in Central America. Great. Belize is a great choice, right? Um, so we want to choose based on where you have connections, where you have ties, where you want to travel. Why? Because then those um, those travels become a good explanation for you know managing your entity, but also they become a tax deduction for you, right? We get to kill multiple birds with one stone. So it's not just pure asset protection. There are other reasons for why we set up the structure and why we approached it that way. So at the end of the day, you know, there was an article that came out uh, about, well, it was last year, I think it was about six months ago or so, 
And the article basically said that the offshore planning that people used to do, that the new uh, asset protection plans are all in the United States. There's no need to go offshore. And the reality is that for most of the protection that most families would need, that's true. There's no need to go offshore to accomplish similar level of protection. We can go to Wyoming, we can go to Alaska, we can you know, set up multiple structures for you and get similar type of asset protection. But there may be other reasons to set up assets outside of the United States beyond pure asset protection. And that's where you know we sit down, we look at the situation, we kind of get a good idea of what options are available there. And then we uh, make an assessment and make recommendations and we're happy to sit down and look at those options and strategize with you. So uh, with that, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up and we're gonna open it up for some question and answer. If uh, you have a question, go ahead and send it through the chat channel here or uh, raise your hand and we'll see if we can unmute you on the, on the podcast. Questions? All right, we have one question, which is uh, a very common question, actually. I get this one a lot. The question was, when should you consider doing offshore planning or this type of planning that we've been talking about? And, uh, you know, the answer is that every situation is a little bit different. Asset protection, asset protection planning is one of those areas that, uh, it, you know, it's a spectrum. You can have more protection. You may not need more protection because you might not ever have anybody sue you. You might not ever have an issue where you actually need the protection. Um, and so you don't want to, you know, go overboard and, you know, put more out there than you really need because then you have administrative hassles and costs and everything else that you have to deal with and you never actually needed that protection. Um, I know that a lot of times, you know, people are recommended to just set up the, the very best you know, that with ironclad, you know, defense, just in case you ever have an issue. But that can backfire also because it can cause a lot of costs and administrative burden that you may or may not actually need. So the best answer is to assess your specific scenario, find out how much protection you actually want to have, um, just in case there is potential liability that comes up. And then take a proportionate response in terms of setting up your entity, your structure, and that sort of thing. And most of the time, unless you have, you know, seven figures worth of assets, it doesn't make sure, it doesn't make sense to even, you know, set up some of these complex structures to try to uh, defend them. Why? Because we can set up other more simple structures to protect your assets if you're under those, those amounts. Uh, once you get, you know, over, you know, seven, multiple seven figures of, of uh, properties or assets, then, then we can look at, you know, some of these more complex structures. All right. Any other questions? Well, we appreciate everybody logging in today. As always, we're going to continue these podcasts. Uh, next week, we will be discussing more in regards to tax planning and uh, state planning as it relates to tax planning. Um, we, uh, we invite you also to listen to any of our um, past and previous podcasts that we've put on YouTube uh, and uh, that are available on multiple podcasting channels wherever you find your podcast. We'll look forward to uh, talking to you all soon. This has been Estate Planning Made Simple, a podcast by LSPN. Join us next week on Clubhouse and on all major podcasting platforms.